<clears throat> Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure on behalf of the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies to welcome the elders here today. I'd like to thank all of them personally, and in particular, Mr. Kofi Annan, the chair of the elders, President Mary Robinson, uh, Ms. Hina Jilani, and President Carter for being on our panel this afternoon. The elders were brought together by the late Nelson Mandela. So it is only fitting to recall his own visit to the center in 1997 as president of South Africa and his inspiring lecture on his hopes for a new world order. Two years later, you, Mr. Anand, then serving as United Nations Secretary General, also lectured here on the need for dialogue of civilizations. These lectures form part of an ongoing series inaugurated in 1993 by the groundbreaking lecture by our patron, <coughs> His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales on Islam and the West. All share the concern that in our densely interconnected world, we have no choice but to establish the conditions for peaceful coexistence. For sure, this theme will come up in our discussions. The center, within its limited domain, contributes to international dialogue by engaging its scholars from different cultural backgrounds in the common endeavor of academic research. The elders, however, operate in a much wider domain. They, have, they represent an unparalleled wealth of experience in statecraft, leadership, and diplomacy. Nelson Mandela gathered them <clears throat> with the mission to speak truth to power. We are most grateful that the elders continue to spend from their wealth of experience by urging the resolution of conflicts through, through dialogue and by promoting the conditions of fairness and peace. The perils of intercivilizational conflict will and should get our attention. But conflicts also arise within civilizations. In some places, communities self-identified by confession or nationality have aggravated these differences to the point of bloody civil wars. There are economic disparities that can damage the cohesion of even the most orderly of societies. There are improprieties in governance that compromise personal dignity, privacy, and basic freedoms. But it's not for me to say what the topics of our discussions will be today, so I'll not prolong these remarks. Instead, I invite the chair of elders to introduce the panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kofi Annan. Thank you very much uh, for that warm welcome and for inviting the elders to join you here this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Nizami, for that generous introduction. We are delighted to be here this afternoon at this prestigious building today addressing such distinguished audience, both younger and older, and to be the guest of this center. I recall my last visit 15 years ago. We are a group of independent leaders brought together as you heard by late Nelson Mandela in 2007. We use our collective experience and influence in the service of peace, 
justice and human rights. We define our three primary goals as first, just and inclusive global community. Second, freedom from fear. And third, freedom from want. And of course, as you heard, he also charged us to speak truth to power. On the panel this afternoon, we have former President Carter starting at the other end, El Abad, and no, sorry, Hina <laughs> Hina Jilani. See, I'm getting confused. I'm an elder. Hina <laughs> <laughs> Jilani and Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, and myself. <clears throat> And we have in the audience Ella Bat and former President Atisari of Finland. And we are all very happy to be here with you this afternoon. Regarding today's event, I would like to start by making a few remarks and then uh, move on to exchanges with the rest of the panel. Let me read you a short passage from the Harvard Negotiations Project written 30 years ago. You will find it extremely interesting. Communication is never easy, even between people who have an enormous background of shared values and experience. Couples who have lived together with each other for 30 years may still have misunderstandings and differences, but that doesn't apply to any of us in this room. <laughs> it is not surprising then to find poor communication between people who do not know each other, do not know each other well, and who may feel hostile and suspicious of one another. Whatever you say, you should expect the other side will always hear something different. That is the, Oxford, uh, the Harvard Negotiation Group. A, ch a challenging assertion, obviously. So how can we move from conflict through dialogue to peace? As the title of our event today states, that is the question that we will seek to address I will make a few opening remarks to get the discussions going and to try to stimulate the debate. One way to avoid miscommunication and to build peace is to, make, is to take deliberate steps to improve our cultural understanding of the other. The natural, very human temptation is to hide behind the fortifications of our own prejudices on the grounds that opening up to the other puts you in a weaker position. That may be so in the short term, but in the longer term, it enables us to use our greater understanding in positive ways that strengthen us while drawing the other side into constructive dialogue. One of the greatest enemies of cultural <clears throat> understanding is too rigid an adherence to political and religious ideology, or perhaps a too rigid sense of rightness of one's cause or path. It leaves no psychological space for recognizing and accepting alternative perspectives. Such recognition need not compromise our integrity. On the contrary, it can reaffirm it by encouraging the other to accept our perspective as a legitimate part of common commentary or vision. Another enemy of cultural understanding 
is the refusal to acknowledge the other side's historical narrative. A good example of this is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In this case, hardliners on both sides cannot bring themselves to accept that the other side has legitimate historical links to the same small piece of land for that reason. For that reason, among others, there is no room for dialogue, let alone the concept of sharing and enjoying the richness of dual inheritance. Fortunately, there are some brave Israelis and Palestinians who have recognized each other's emotional attachment to the land and are prepared to act on their convictions. The question is, how can we make their voices prevail? It is a great mistake, in my view, to yield to the temptation of de deducing the intentions of the other party from your own fears. This tendency almost led to a nuclear catastrophe during the Cold War between East and West. And today, is helping to fuel the conflict in Syria because the fears of Saudis and Iranians in particular have of each other's intentions. In such cases, a lack of cultural understanding as to the inflammable nature of fear and the assumptions that flow from it. Some of these fears will be irrational and unwarranted. Others may be justified, but an honest and measured articulation of them to the other side has a good chance of improving the relationship and lowering the temperature, especially if done in private, away from the glare of television lights. Emotive accusations made publicly will have the opposite effect. As, <clears throat> as a species, we have traditionally delegated <clears throat> the responsibility for engaging in conflict and negotiating peace to men. We have only recently begun to appreciate how much potential the other half of human race has to handle conflict in less destructive ways, and how big a stick in it it has in preventing it from degenerating into open war. It is, after all, women to whom a disproportionate burden falls in coping with the effects and the aftermath of war, in protecting and feeding the children, and in caring for the elderly, the sick, wounded, and the disabled. Their more pacific perspective must be heard more, and thus the voice of women brought to the negotiating table. Conflict within states, ethnic groups, or families can be just as intractable as conflicts between them sometimes more so, particularly when there is a gap, a wide gap between rich and poor, and on equal access to resources. Good governance that embeds transparency and accountability at all levels is essential for preventing and redressing injustice and mediating the peaceful solution to disputes. Unlike a strong and vibrant civil society, which is needed within a state, allows its people, including minorities, to feel included and empowered. What is true within state is equally true globally, particularly when it comes to a just allocation of the world's resources. As I mentioned earlier, Freedom from fear 
is one of our three primary goals. Since 2007, the elders have been using their influence and experience to help resolve conflicts and reduce tensions and to build enduring peace. To that end, we have visited conflict hotspots such as uh, North and South Korea, Israel and Palestine, Sudan and South Sudan, Myanmar, and earlier this year we were in uh, Iran for talks with their leadership and others. An event of this kind enables us to present publicly our thinking on conflict, dialogue, and peace, and to pick up ideas from well-informed audiences such as the one in this hall today. I would like to now hand over to our moderator, Dr. Nizami, to pose his questions and to moderate our discussions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Anand, for giving me the impossible task of <laughs> moderating this. Uh, and uh, the intention is to make it as interactive as possible. This event is also being, is, uh, there's live streaming. So we will have questions on social media as well. I'll try to keep the peace, but if I fail to include everyone, then please forgive me. I start with that. Also, if we keep our questions very brief, we would be able to uh, fit in many people. I'll try to uh, read out, as it were, the headlines of what you have mentioned, and perhaps just provide the structure for the conversation. Perhaps the best place would be to start off with the need for cultural understanding, thing that you identified also in your lecture at the center, and President Mandela did that, and indeed the Prince of Wales earlier had done so. But what you said, Mr. Anand, now about the importance of understanding the other, and particularly the narrative of the other, perhaps if there are issues, questions on that, if we could start off with that and then move on to some of the other themes. There is the, the whole issue of conflict resolution, the status of women, civil society, and so on. And I'll try and just keep an eye on my watch to bring in as many themes as possible. So would anybody like to raise the issues uh, relevant to cultural understanding and the need for narrative. Do I see somebody there? Uh, hello. Is this working? Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, hosting this panel. Uh, my question relates to cultural understanding. Could you speak up, please? <clears throat> Sorry, my question relates to cultural understanding. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on how we as individuals are able to recognize our own cultural values and biases, and through that, um, have an open and more constructive dialogue with other cultures. And secondly, what is the role of mass media um, in terms of cross-cultural exchange and in terms of perhaps maybe reinforcing our own prejudices uh, regarding the other, quote unquote. Thank you. So, I think what's being asked how we can uh, be ourselves and yet understand the other, and does the media help or hinder that process, if I understood you correctly? Well, I, I believe that. Um, Every human being has multiple identities. And we not need to recognize that. I mean, I'm a woman, I'm a Muslim woman, I'm a Pakistani, I'm a human rights activist, I may be a mother, a sister. So there are several identities that you have. You have to become comfortable with your multiple identities first before you can put people at ease with what you are as a whole. And um, I would also th say that um, Cultural specificity uh, has certain um, connotations which may not necessarily be conducive 
to bringing harmony within the, the human society. Um, I do believe that there must be understanding between cultures, but that, let that understanding not go to the extreme of condoning practices that may be harmful to people within the same culture or in any way allow the conscience of the international community to abandon those within that culture who are fighting to ward off the harmful practices that are thought of as culture but are not really a part of what positive culture should mean. Like to. Yeah, if I could maybe build on what, what Hina was saying. I remember when I was serving as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and you'd get a challenge, you know, your human rights are Western values, they're not our values. But actually, I found that it was mainly leaders who were not very open and uh, available to their population who would say that. When you went and talked to people in the civil society, they wanted, um, but they wanted it to be expressed in their cultural terms. Very often, spiritual, religious terms, but nonetheless they wanted the values, the freedoms. And I think it's very good to uh, have that kind of open discussion um, on human rights, on gender equality, but understand that it has to be embedded in the broader spiritual and identity culture of the country, and it'd be much stronger if it is. But I also very much agree with Hina that we must distinguish between what is cultural and uh, you know, a positive issue to be discussed, and what is harmful traditional practices, um, child marriage, genital cutting, etc. And we need to understand that these are issues that have to be tackled from within the village, from within the community, but we have to have a very strong sense of not, um, not over uh, sort of reaching out in a cultural sense and, and dropping our standards. Um, I think we, we need to maintain those standards. Well, <clears throat> I mentioned at lunch today that I got advice from a high school teacher that we must accommodate changing times but cling to unchanging principles. Uh, my wife and I have 21 grandchildren. We've been married 68 years. And so we have three different generations among our grandchildren. Our youngest is three years old. Our oldest is 39. And we try to see how much their lives are different from the ones that I knew when I was a child myself. And we see the impact of, of, of changing times, where they are quite different from us. But the unchanging principles are the ones, I think, that would be called cultural values. And whether you're Jewish or Christian or, or Islamic or, or Buddhist or whatever, those uh, unchanging principles are embedded within the framework of every great religion. And they involve peace and human rights and justice and compassion. And when those are violated, we see the deterioration in general elements of society. I would say that the three largest projects that the, court, that the elders are now addressing involve different uh, elements of discrimination against certain groups. One group would be the Palestinians, about four and a half million or so who live in the Holy Land, as I call it. And, and this is a gross violation of our basic human rights, which have not yet been addressed. The second group would be much larger, more than half the population of the world, and that would be women and girls. They suffer horribly from abuse, primarily perpetrated by, uh, I'd say, autocratic or dominant men. And these are men in, in uh, commerce and trade, they're men in uh, religion, they're men in academic worlds that deprive women of equal rights uh, under the basic laws and, and rules that we've all adopted in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I would say the third thing about that we are current concerned with is a threat to humanity in general. And that is the failure of leaders and the general population to deal with the threat of global warming. And this, I think, in the next 40 or 50 years can bring a devastating blight or plight or horrible suffering and increased conflict among people who suffer from the loss of their homelands and loss of their livelihood as global warming changes. So from, from a small, very small group of Palestinians to women in general and to the whole human race, those are the, are the things that depart from the basic elements of society that we look upon as unchanging values or ethical standards that human beings have adopted but quite often uh, fail to honor. 
Fine. Maybe I could open it up a little more on the issue of conflict resolution. And then we can bring in more people because I think there would be an overlap on some of these issues. I also wanted to share some of the uh, feedbacks we are getting on the social media, and I have been provided with those, and I sh should therefore read those out. Uh, understandably, there is great concern about some of the hotspots on Syria, on uh, Africa, in Myanmar, Palestine, Iraq, some of these areas that you have uh, touched upon, Mr. Anand. Uh, Fernando from Brazil asks you, how can we mitigate the huge issue of wealth concentration and its political consequences on a global level? If I could read out one or two of these and then perhaps invite you to. Uh, there is uh, Fadi Issa Oglu from Turkey asking what can we do about Syria? What can the elders do about Syria? Uh, there is Tendani on Twitter asking what will it take to get rid of extremist trends in Nigeria, in Kenya, and in other parts of Africa. Sarah asks on Facebook, is it possible for the elders to take part more in worldly affairs, and how are the elders carrying on Madiba's legacy? Uh, and, uh, of course, there is one on climate as well as part of, of conflict, how this conflict uh, is aggravated by climate change. As Steve McGraw asks, we need to act on climate, but have been pushed back by many who should know better. Any suggestions on how to move action beyond partisan politics? These are the ones that we have on social media, but I'm sure there are others who would like to raise issues on conflict resolution. But would you like to start, and then we can take more? No, I think the issue of uh, poverty and the gap between the rich and the poor is very topical today. And, I, and I'm sure in this community, most of you have either read or seen the book by Thomas Piketty on the capitalism in the 21st century, which is being discussed everywhere, arguing that um, we need, we, you know, and most people will argue that we need to do something about the gap between the rich and the poor within nations and between nations. And I think, the, of course, the policies of governments are important. Uh, I see in the third world, for example, there's often an uh, incredible amount spent by governments on subsidies, subsidies for everybody. Let's say fuel subsidies in your country or mine. Fuel subsidies goes to everybody and usually is a middle class who will get it and they don't need it. Could the government use that money to support the poor? The middle class can buy their own gas. If you can buy a car, you can buy gas. But if the, if the resources were to use to support the poor, give them education, give them health, and ensure that there's equal access to opportunity, then you are improving the conditions in society. On, on Syria, if I may comment, since I have been associated. Oh, oh you lost my mic. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I was going to say, <laughs> it's amazing, all the students were quiet, it was a vice chancellor who, who pointed it out to me. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. I hope you heard my first answer about the, the gap between the rich and the poor. Now let me say something about Syria. Syria is a very complex and a dangerous uh, conflict which has embraced uh, the whole region and could inflame the region uh, further. Uh, I am disappointed that the, the divisions within the Security Council still persist. But if you look at Syria in terms of, let's say, three circles, the first circle is what is happening in Syria 
and the divisions among Syrians. The second circle is the region. What is happening in the region and the role of regional powers. And then, of course, you have the wider international community in the form of the Security Council. As long as these divisions persist, it's going to be extremely difficult to resolve Syria. We need to see some movements or alliances. I would like to see a situation, and in a way, that is what I had tried to do with the Geneva One talks, which should have brought together the permanent members of the Security Council who were in Geneva for the talks. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and, and Qatar to discuss the issue. Unfortunately, we could not get Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, there. And so we went through loops of a uh, bureaucratic approach where we had Qatar as the chairman of the Syrian Committee of the Arab League, <coughs> Iraq as a president of the, of, of the, of the League, and um, uh, uh, we had, yeah, Kuwait was chairing uh, the other group. So we had the three countries there. But the three countries that I wanted there, the two other key ones, see, uh, Iran and um, Saudi Arabia were not there. You cannot solve that problem if you do not make a, uh, get a core group going, a core group made up at the minimum of the permanent members of the Security Council and Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. I'm sure Egypt, now that is solving its problems, would also insist on being part of the core group. They will need to work together, make a common core course, come with a program, and say we are going to work to make sure we end the struggle and commit from all sides not to support any of the groups uh, in, in Syria. If you do not do that, the process will constantly be undermined. Uh, this is the way I see the CN. So we continue our divisions. In the meantime, Syrians are paying with their lives. Actually, the issues that you mentioned um, from social media are some of the issues that we have been discussing. Uh, for example, issues in Africa, conflicts in Africa. Um, I happen to have a mandate as the UN Special Envoy for the Central African region, which is 13 countries and supported by four institutions, the United Nations, the African Union, the Conference of the Great Lakes Region, and uh, the Southern African, SADC. And we are making some progress because countries committed uh, to taking steps under a framework of last year. And we have a regional oversight mechanism and a national oversight mechanism in the Congo and the DRC, which are tracking that. And we are seeing armed groups being defeated. And in fact, tomorrow we may see another armed group about to surrender, the former genocidaire in Rwanda. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's complex. One of the things that I've brought to the issue, because it's already been mentioned uh, by Kofi, um, is the importance of women being at the table, the importance of women being involved, and um, uh, the, the role of women at local level in uh, resolving disputes and coping and leading their communities has to be resolved. So we have a women's platform now for the Great Lakes, specifically for that. And the other issue that we spent a lot of time on this morning is climate change, for the reasons that Jimmy Carter mentioned. It is the biggest issue facing the world. It will make all the conflicts more aggravated because more people will be displaced. Um, we'll have food shortages. We'll have a whole range of climate shocks unless this year and next year we take the steps that are necessary. A, um, a legally binding, robust, fair climate agreement in Paris at the end of next year, and sustainable development goals, which bear in mind staying below the two degrees of global warming. And it's top of our concerns because as elders, we see the potential impact. Would you like to say? I, I just want to say a few words about Nelson Mandela's vision. I think that while we will do everything we can to uh, make sure that the vision lasts. We don't want to just preserve it. We want it to grow. Uh, we would like the principles to become universal principles. And those principles must determine how people who are willing to serve 
are going to make sure that they do whatever they can and make whatever the effort they can to order to give the, the world a, a world order that be, that is based on equality, on the value of human dignity, on the values of uh, freedom, on the above all on the value of the commitment to protect and promote human rights and to defend human rights. And I think that's very important that uh, not everybody will perhaps uh, do it in the same manner as one person does it, but there are several ways in which people contribute to making a more tolerant society, a society where there is harmony, a society where communities are at peace, and a society that is willing to accommodate differences and to celebrate diversity rather than find reasons for diversity and divisions. And you wanted to come in. No, I, I just wanted to support what President Carter and President uh, Robinson said about climate change. It is really an issue for the young. It is your world. It is a world you are going to inherit. And you should really become engaged in this movement to protect the planet. We sometimes sit back and helplessly ask, what can I do as an individual? As individuals, you have power. You have your votes. You have the choices you make when you go to the supermarket. And you can really use your voice and influence to push the climate change issue higher up the political ag agenda and maintain pressure on political leaders until they act to protect this planet. We cannot keep con consuming as if there is no tomorrow. And so use your influence and really uh, become engaged. Uh, I often maintain that when leaders fail to lead, the people can make them follow. You are the people. Make them follow. Okay. Well, I think that one of the things that we all need to be concerned about is the, I'd say, the negative trend in the world now away from the principles that were adopted immediately after the Second World War, where we generally said democracy and freedom and human rights would prevail, and also primarily peace. Uh, we hope that the United Nations would provide a basis for re resolution of conflict without two nations going to war. But we've seen with the pride and the self-protection of, of our own interest in the five permanent members, an almost complete loss of the ability of the United Nations to address difficult issues. So we have many more conflicts now than we had before. And the human rights bases have been largely abandoned as well. And in, in great democracies, and I'll use my own country as an example, we've seen a tremendous deterioration in the relationship among our people. Uh, Kofi mentioned in his opening remarks the disparity in uh, income between the richest and the poorest, not only between countries but inside countries. After, since I left the White House, for instance, there's been five times as much wealth concentrated in the top 1% as did as occurred when I was in the White House. And this is because primarily that money has become more important than human beings. The Supreme Court of the United States has ruled, I'll use a crude expression very stupidly, that corporations could take the place of people or had, to, had the uh, same status as people. So now money pours in to the entire political system, not only in elections, but after the elections are over. So the average member of the parliament and so forth is very receptive to receiving money and votes according to where the money comes from. And, and this has resulted not only in, in a dis growing disparity of favors for the rich people to keep what they earn, but also to deprive the middle class and, and, and working people of their basic rights, even as compared to 30 years ago. Another example of the discrimination is the people who abide by the law and uh, white people against people that sometimes violate the law, quite often non-violent crimes. Our country, since I left the White House again, we have, five, we have seven times as many people in prison now as we had in 1980. And we have eight times as many black women in prison now as we did when I left the White House. And we also have uh, adhered to the death penalty in my country, which means that the people who get uh, executed or put to death because of our crimes almost exclusively African-Americans or Spanish people or people who are mentally retarded or mentally ill in some way. So this is a powerful 
people in the ascendant positions in politics and government and, and also in economics not paying attention to the basic human rights that equate all people within a, a democratic society, of which we're all proud. I'm proud of my country, but, but I see this trend in my country repeated even in the recent vote in the European Union. Right. Uh, the lady here, you want, did you want to? Yeah, there's a mic. Hello. Um, I don't know how you begin. I don't know how you begin to explain a culture of conflict um, or conflict in a culture. And this question is for Hina Jilani. How do you explain to yourself and to the rest of the world a country which is full of all kinds of conflicts and as well as contradictions? where there are women who are heading banks, piloting planes, and where a father kills his own daughter in front of a crowd outside a court because the woman decided to choose to marry a man of her, her own choice, um, a decision which is supported by her religion as well as the law of the land. How do you explain that, and how do you begin to resolve that conflict? I don't explain it at all. I fight it. I, I feel outraged by all these trends that prevent any country from resolving the differences that emerge from your different identities. That is something we can never change. So if a conflict is based on because, uh, you know, because where I was born or what language I speak, I'm not supposed to change that. I'm supposed to be accommodated by the pluralistic trends within that society, and that's what we are fighting for. That's why I, says, I, I said I will not explain it, but I will also not accept that these are things that we cannot change. These may be realities, but these are realities that we are in the business of changing. And the tools we use for changing them are human rights values, the values of human dignity, the protection of people who are vulnerable, the, the whole concept of equality, the whole concept of equal opportunities. I think these are the tools that we used to ensure that what you have pointed out <clears throat> will be eliminated. And I think many of us, although we, are, we still know that we have a long way to go, do believe that we have had successes. Um, I think the, the, the major issues that are, we are all confronting at this time, regardless of the country where these trends are happening, is not just uh, social uh, practices, but also extremist behaviors that have somehow become a part of national security interests. And when they become a part of national security interests, then you're not just in the business of raising awareness within a society or trying to change a social mindset, then you're in the business of uh, 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 you know, um, constructing very powerful um, um, means of breaking the trend of using particular extremist ideas and ideologies for national security interests. And I think this is where the world has also to make sure that we should not treat extremism only as a social trend. It is not. not. It is not just a religious trend. It is not. It is also a very political idea. Right. I think we have a lady here, and then Edward Mortimer. Thank you. Um, could I raise um, what appears to some people to be a very big question, and the elders deal with very big questions. In your lifetime, the population of the world has much more than doubled. Conflict can arise from competition for resources, and the more people there are, the more competition. And climate change can be put down partly to the fact that many more of us are using up resources. Um, is the stabilization of population something that should be included in the sustainable development goals? Is population a problem or is it irrelevant? And if so, 
Uh, why is it irrelevant? Sorry. Um, I, I think that population is very relevant and we know how to address it. Um, education of girls and women and good health policies and access to contraceptives um, in uh, countries. There's a huge unmet need. Over 200 million women want to have access to contraceptives and can't at the moment. And so it is a very big issue. I hope it will be an issue addressed uh, full on and four square in the sustainable development goals. It will be a battle because some countries still um, oppose um, access to contraception and family planning um, in, in international um, uh, um, uh, goals and, and conferences. But it, it is a crucial issue and um, it, it's, uh, it's good that African countries now, for example, um, are very clear and have had a number of conferences on this issue and want to have access to family planning. Edward, I'm going to come back to this. I have noticed many hands, but uh, yeah, go ahead. yes. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman, you alluded to the importance of narratives in the context of cultural differences. And in this part of the world, we are watching with great concern at the moment the development of the conflict in Ukraine, where different narratives seem to play a very important part. The, um, the Russian media and the Russian-speaking, or at least some of the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine, seem to have a completely different understanding of how this conflict developed and what it's about from what uh, most of us uh, in Western Europe have. And I would wonder if the panel would have any comment on that, whether they see this as reflecting cultural differences or is it simply a question of misinformation and propaganda on one or both sides? I don't think it was ever any way possible to prevent Crimea uh, going to Russia because uh, even in ancient times when I was president, there was a general assumption that Crimea was part of Russia. And uh, the people in Crimea overwhelmingly felt that they were part of Russia. So that was an inevitab inevitability that no sanctions could have prevented. My own belief is that Putin will not use military force to go into eastern uh, Ukraine because that would be, bring too much of a condemnation and also increase sanctions and maybe even conflict militarily against Russia. So I don't believe he'll do that. But what he's going to do is to try to seduce the people that live in Ukraine and have an orientation uh, toward Russia to see that that's their best, that their best hope in the future. I think he's going to give them blandishments of all kinds, including increased opportunities for trade and commerce and easy passage across the border and, and loans and grants. And, and he has said that he would honor the results of the election. I hope he will do so. My own hope is that, uh, that Ukraine will not become uh, induced by the Western world to go and cast their lot as a nation toward the Europe and the West, nor with, with go into Russia as well. I would like to see Ukraine stay neutral as far as which direction they go and benefit from aid from both Russia and the Western world. And, and let the people there choose what, they want, what language they want to speak and, and which country they want to visit on vacation, where they want to do their trade. And perhaps the recent election, where one of the very wealthy men in Ukraine seems to be the new president, I, th I think with his investments in Russia, he will see that it's maybe best for Ukraine not to cast its lot particularly to the east or west. It may have been a mistake in the past for, for us to try to seduce Ukraine to come west to the abandonment of Russia. I think the people there are divided. Let them go the way they want to and let, as a nation, not cast its lot to one side to the exclusion of the other. There is this lady there at the back. Um, I have, thank you so much for opportunity for us to raise the question regarding to elders. I understand that 
um, Mr. Ernan already explained and touched upon about gender role in peace process. And coming from Burma, and I also understand that you have traveled to Thai Burma border as well as ethnic conflict area such as Kachin State in, Tha in Burma. And I am, and you must have seen many able, strong women, as well as you must have noticed there is no women in peace process. As the el elders of the world, how can you be sure, how can you make sure that women, half of the population, and able, experienced peace negotiator to be invo involved in peace process? There is simply no women, no peace. Thank you. <laughs> Who would like to take that? What? No, I think you're absolutely right. And in my own opening remarks, I refer to this issue. And in fact, the UN Security Council has a resolution encouraging involvement of women in the peace, uh, in peace processes. And I can speak from my own experience that when you have these discussions, the nature of it changes when there are women at the table. They bring sensitivity and raises issues that we men tend to ignore. And uh, given their own temperament, their caring nature and others, they are also likely to be open to compromises in a way of finding solutions. So we as elders support participation of women and wherever we can press the implementation of the Security Council resolution on participation of women in peace processes. So you are right and you spoke very forcefully and I'm sure when you go home and you get the chance, you will be participating. <laughs> I want to bring in two people who have been holding their hand for a very long time here before we move on to other themes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, we would be remiss sitting in this beautiful atmosphere if we didn't talk about education. Um, and I think one of the things which give me hope about the coming century is the seeming universality of the appeal of education. Um, so I'd like to hear about not only ac increasing access for primary education around the world, but also quite specifically about the role of universities um, and what, what we as students, as educators, can do within our own universities to start to address some of these problems. Because I think universities are particular institutions um, which are especially well-placed to start to try and mend some of these problems. Well, I've been a professor at Emory University for 32 years, and so I've seen different groups of students go through, and there are cycles there because there are periods in history when, for some reason, the students have an overwhelming desire just to make money when they get out of, of uh, university. And then there comes a few years later, they want to be more altruistic and, and do uh, human things to help other people. It goes up and down. But I believe that this is a time of, uh, of almost unprecedented freedom within a human being's life, either before they get to the university when they often are dominated by their parents and, and other reasons, and then after they leave the university they have a job and they are obligated to, to please their bosses, uh, or you get promoted to a higher position in a corporation or, and so forth. So that, that's when I think students have the freedom to, to look into this complicated subject matters of the, of the world at this moment and make bold and aggressive decisions. And, and I, I think even if it's a small group of students, for instance, on the Oxford campus or where I teach at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, a, a small group of, of dedicated students who really believe in something can make a profoundly significant impact on their general society and on society as a, in, in, in the broadest sense. So, so I think that's what should be done. And, and whether I don't know what your particular interest might be, but if you're interested, for instance, in global warming, or if you're interested in women's rights, or if you're interested in peace in, 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 in the world, or the resolution of differences among religions, those kind of things have to be emphasized by, by you and a few who, whom you recruit to be fervent believers. And, and the last thing I'll mention is that if you're a fervent believer, you can have a much greater impact than a general public who might disagree with you, but a lukewarm in their beliefs. So a small group of fervent believers, particularly on a campus, can make a profoundly important difference, even in the Parliament of Great Britain or the Congress. 
I started to say Congress of the United States. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Perhaps we'll take one more question on these themes and then move uh, uh, on. There's this gentleman waiting for a long time, the one in the blue shirt. And then... Thank you very much for this opportunity, and in particular to raise the, the case of Syria. I'm from Syria, and my question is about the, the peace process in, in Syria, any pass, uh, possible peace processes. Um, after the, the just revolution, which is turned into civil war because of the brutality of the regime, um, and now the, with the salient uh, sectarian element of the war, um, in general, uh, to what extent do you think that religious leaders, uh, Sunni and Shia leaders, should be included in peace processes, uh, like leaders from Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq? Uh, to, uh, to, to what extent uh, they should be included? And um, do you think they will be able to be included? They will be allowed? Thank you. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. I, I know that there are informal contacts which brings together religious groups uh, from Syria and the region to discuss some of these uh, issues. Religious leaders have an important role to play. Uh, they are preaching in the mosques every Friday. They can give a message of peace. They can educate and they can help steer uh, people towards uh, dialogue and non-violence. Non they may not be necessarily at all the meetings, whether it's Geneva 1 or Geneva 2, but there has to be a mechanism that brings them together to play a role. You are right, the Syrian crisis is, is, is sectarian, it's regional, it's tribal, and you need to really look at it in all its aspects. And anyone who has a a role to play and can be part of the solution, should be engaged. And now be, I'm very much in favor of engaging religious leaders. But of course, there are some religious leaders who are not that constructive. They should also be identified. And uh, 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 I was going to, uh, you can't shut them up, but they should be ostracized. <laughs> and their influence uh, contained. Yeah. I think we've nicely moved on to this theme of sectarianism uh, within societies as well, and perhaps if there are issues on that. Uh, I know that on the social media we have had comments, particularly with regard to what's happening in Africa, but I notice uh, somebody here who wanted to come if it is on this theme. It is on this theme. Thank you very much for, uh, for an excellent uh, talk so far. My question regard, uh, concerns your personal experiences. All of you come from countries with very stark regional differences and very complex, often violent histories. And I was wondering what you could share from your own homeland and its own experience in bringing together the very disparate groups and very disparate regions and what we can learn from that for our more global conversation. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, I must say the experience of the, uh, the conflict in Northern Ireland had a great influence on me uh, as a lawyer and then uh, when I was elected uh, President of Ireland because it was before a formal peace process had started. And it was just the terrible tragedy for a people when there's fighting in the street, when young people um, are taking up guns and being kneecapped and their mothers don't know where they are, just the sheer stark uh, tragedy of it. And it was very interesting. Um, uh, in 1995, uh, President Bill Clinton um, sent um, an envoy to Ireland um, to have a um, peace conference, uh, sorry, a, um, a, a development conference, an economic conference in Belfast, even though there was still fighting in the street. And somehow it created in the mind of people that there could be a peace dividend. And that led to more talks at various levels, but that peace dividend, I'm now trying in the Great Lakes area to borrow from that experience 
and we're planning a private sector investment conference. Um, when uh, last May, May of last year, um, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the President of the World Bank came together to the Great Lakes and talked about the need for development, peace and development. And I think that nexus was really very important. And then the other thing which we've talked about is women being involved more in peace processes. They were involved on the ground in Belfast. They were the ones who came out from the housing estates and met their counterparts. I'm sure, Hina, you have even starker stories to tell, but I was very affected by that experience in trying to <coughs> address the issues now. Now, I think I come from a country where the conflict is so complex that it's very difficult to explain uh, in a brief moment. But let me just say, beginning with the question that was being asked in terms of what kind of peace processes, if they're, you know, whether we should have Shias or Sunnis um, in terms of Syria. And one thing that came immediately to my mind was how regret regretful it is that we have to talk of people in terms of Sunnis and Shias. Are there no Syrians left? So these are some of the concerns that we who live in uh, sectarian-ridden uh, conflicts uh, experience every day. Um, these are also, again, as I said, um, ways and means of using differences to perpetuate violence and divisions in the society. It is very difficult to overcome situations of these kind of conflicts. Faith leaders do their best, but once these demons are leashed, unleashed, it's very difficult to control them. Um, we are living in a country where we've had uh, experiences uh, that are not very fortunate, not only because of what we have done, but also because of what has gone on around us in the region. But at the same time, obviously, uh, uh, the society itself and the state has suffered a great deal. Women, non-Muslim minorities um, in particular have suffered. But that suffering is not just for the, these particular categories. This has weakened the society as a whole. It has also rendered the state, state an almost failed state, which cannot fulfill its duty to protect its people, particularly its women and the more vulnerable communities. I'd like to bring in the lady there, and if somebody could get a mic here, who wanted to come in. Uh, thank you. Does, does it work? Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Russian, so I would like to thank for the question on the Ukraine and Russia conflict, and I really appreciated the answer because it's actually can really more complex cl than it seems. Can you the mic can, I, can you hear me? Yes. So, sorry. Um, I, I would like to thank for the question on Ukraine-Russia because I'm Russian and I appreciated the answer as well um, because indeed the situation is much more complex than it is represented in media. I would like to ask the following question. Um, since Ms. Robinson said uh, indeed that values are shared among people and they tend to agree that they want freedoms and they want uh, human rights uh, and it's leaders that tend to oppose sharing these freedoms with people rather than people themselves. So wouldn't you think that it may be not about the cultural differences, but about the political will and whether or not it is in place and whether maybe it's more of race for power and power using media to influence people rather than the cultural differences, because essentially we're all the same. We all want the same thing. Thank you. Can I go say something? Yeah. While the mic is there, could we also bring in this lady and perhaps if you could take both. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to engage with you in this way. My name is Zara Latif. My parents were born and brought up in Bangladesh and I have been born and brought up in the UK. My question is about cultural narratives and conflict resolution. Um, you, you may be aware, I'm sure you are aware, um, of the, of the uh, language that has been common in the run-up to the European elections and the results in Britain, um, a particular party, uh, the language has been used that it, it caused a volcano and earthquake, although I wouldn't necessarily agree. Um, my question is that people themselves as indi individuals might be comfortable with their multiple identities, but when the media is so insistent on pushing forward a certain narrative that is divisive, what can we do to combat that? 
Let me take on the first question. I think uh, it links up also with the question that Edward asked earlier about narratives. Uh, basically, I, I believe that uh, the media has lots of work to do. Uh, honestly, uh, on some of these crises, they have not done serious analysis. In some cases, I see them cheerleading. It's almost like a soccer game. You choose your side and you push the opposition and not really posing questions. And in today's world, it's so instantaneous. These things get out almost immediately and people take sides, lock in their positions. And unfortunately, the leaders also get caught in it. And they keep pointing fingers at each other, making accusations publicly, when in fact they should be speaking very quietly to be able to resolve some of these uh, issues. In the end, they do talk quietly. In the end, they have to negotiate, but often loss of harm uh, had been uh, done. And you are right, as Mary said, we all, uh, and President Carter also indicated, major religions share the same thing, charity, compassion, mercy, everything. We all believe in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And even if we don't believe in it, we want it applied to us. Uh, <laughs> And so the idea of uh, getting people to embrace these uh, values, uh, you don't get it done overnight. I mean, the declaration uh, is still being applied. People ask the same question about responsibility to protect. Why isn't it being applied in Syria or this or other situation? You cannot do it overnight. It takes time for people to embrace and, and to get it. On the question of uh, the Bangladesh, uh, the, our uh, friend from Bangladesh, I, I see what you are uh, saying, and I have been rather distressed about some of the language used in the, in the campaign. And, um, but I think we also have to be uh, c careful not to exaggerate the results in the sense that, uh, yes, uh, uh, protest parties had good results, but 70% of the voters supported Europe. We should not forget that. They got 30%, but 70% is with the concept. So the politicians have to get the message, but I don't think they should bend over backwards and in next election embrace the uh, questionable policies of these fringe parties that did well in the European elections. But as well, I think, um you know, it's, it's really disturbing to hear a lot of anti-immigrant language, yeah. a lot of xenophobia, yeah. and uh, carried yeah. by the media to, to a large extent, and very little yeah. counter. Yeah. In fact, parties are shifting to the right yeah. rather than trying to counter with yeah. the values of a pluralist society. And, you know, it's happening in different countries in Europe. It's partly arising from uh, the uh, austerity programs and fear of unemployment and fear that migrants will somehow take the jobs. But this can all, I think, be, be addressed in a much more open and uh, inclusive way. And I think we do need voices to speak up on this. And we need young people um, to, uh, to, you know, to uh, speak for a world where, again, because the population increase is going to be very dramatic. We're going up to 9 billion people by uh, 2050, or 9 billion plus. And we will have to learn to live together. We'll have to learn to respect each other and to uh, have that basic um, uh, capacity for the kind of dialogue we're having here. And uh, it is very distressing when the media uh, somehow take narrow points and aggravate them and uh, whip up an anti-media, anti-migrant um, sentiment. You, you must understand that we are not condemning the media. We are challenging, challenging them, them yeah. <laughs> to move in the right direction. And in yeah. fact, uh, I, Boko Haram, hmm. that madman who leads Boko Haram gave a press conference and they showed him time and time again, turning him into a hero for his people hmm. when he shouldn't be shown on television. Hmm. You can indicate what he said, but don't give him a platform. Hmm. But also, I think this is where uh, what the question that was put earlier about what role can the universities begin. These are where these discussions begin. These are where the uh, 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 diversity within the community can be brought up and uh, political uh, 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 positions be formed. 
in terms uh, so so that these kind of issues and challenges are overcome. And I think this is the role that universities should be playing. Right. Mati, you want to say something on that? Can, before we move here, could we, could President on the Marty Atasari. President Atasari. <clears throat> there you see how democratic this elders group is. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> perhaps a few points. First of all, on media, because I, I think it's fair to say that media in, in at least in some countries that I know, is having an existential uh, battle, how to survive. Their role has changed dramatically in our societies. And <clears throat> that means that in order for them to get readers, they some, one gets sometimes a feeling that they have actually to create conflicts if the conflicts are not there already. So have a careful look when you analyze the newspapers, printed media particularly, and, and see whether you can support me in my analysis. On the peace negotiations and, and cultural feelings in that, I can give you a concrete example when my organization, Crisis Management Initiative, was asked to help Indonesian government and Free Atze movement to find a common position on the, on the basis of Indonesian government's offer of special autonomy for Aceh province. There was a young, relatively young minister from Indonesian government side, Hamid Avaludin, and he proposed in the first meeting I shared that could we agree that when we start these negotiations, uh, we would have a principle in mind that we should treat each other with the principal dignity for all. Then, the role of media. I wanted to keep the media out of our negotiations entirely. So I proposed to the parties that let's agree, in order to be able to open the most difficult issues, and there were many of them, let's agree that nothing is agreed before everything is agreed. So none of the parties could run to the press that now we got something that was absolutely vital for us. And to my great surprise, they accepted my proposal and never broke that rule. I knew from the beginning that they wanted peace because they had negotiated for three years the ceasefire agreement which collapsed after half a year. So you can see that this sort of means can actually help the negotiation processes. I could be speaking here for the rest of the day, but I hand it over to my chair. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, I have got the generous agreement of the chair for an extension for 10 minutes. We should have finished by now, yeah, but we yeah. have started a little late. So I would try to bring four or five people whom I know have been raising their hand for a long time, but please be brief. And before we finish, I have to invite the Vice Chancellor to say a few words. You wanted to say something. Khaled Ali Reza from Saudi Arabia, although I'll be speaking to you as a soul of the world. <clears throat> I hear today that you are trying to address conflict and conflict resolution. And there is nothing better than to actually lead by example. In this world, we have unfortunately fell into a trap of uh, the United Nations mm -hmm. since World War II to be what is today conceived as unfair. At that time, it was necessary because there was no leadership at that time, and you needed leadership. And so the five nations were created. So if we can lead by example and show the world that there is a true uh, way of handling matters in a democratic way, I think this is the best time to ad abandon the United Nations call for five and have a multi-resolution uh, uh, 
uh, country. I, I'm not advocating each country has one vote or something like that, but you can devise a method that you can at least have everybody who, whether you are a woman or you have a, uh, a, conflict, a conflict of Syria, or you can say that at least the world want a, a fair and, and proper future led by the world body. And I address this to Kofi Annan, Your Excellency, and President Carter, if I may to. <laughs> Jimmy, you want to go first? Well, I think this would be best answered by the former Secretary General, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce, I'll introduce uh, Kofi. Well, I think this was something that the, that the elders have discussed a great deal the last two, in the last two days. It's what to do about the United Nations, which is now deteriorated into a situation where it's almost inevitable that you'll have uh, Russia and China, for instance, voting one way, and the United States and, and France and Great Britain voting the other way, and one out of five disagrees with what the others say, so there's almost always a stalemate if there's any controversial co thing coming up. Uh, one, this is something that we will be discussing in the future, I think, in an increasing way. Uh, one of the things that could be done is to increase the authority of the General Assembly, and because the General Assembly uh, includes uh, nations that have now become as dominant politically and, and uh, I'd say militarily and also as economically as the five were at the end of the Second World War. Uh, we've got Japan, we have uh, Brazil, we have, uh, China, we have India, uh, we have South America, we have others that are very uh, strongly influential but have no voice at all in, in the United Nations except on the rare occasions when they happen to be uh, members. So I think this is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, one thing else that, that uh, has been a very serious problem is that the United Nations uh, avoids the, the issues that are quite, quite substantive, but when they pass a, a resolution, it's not carried out. Uh, whenever Israel believes something, they know that the United States is going to veto anything with which the Israelis disagree. So that's almost cut and dried. So there's, a, there's an inclination to avoid the Security Council because of that, of that issue. And recently we had a good example of that to bring out one point that I made, and that is the General Assembly voted to let the Palestinians finally be recognized as a state, at least in a, in a non-voting way. But this gives the, the Palestinians for the first time access to all the elements uh, that, that comprise the, the United Nations. So here is one example where the General Assembly took position that the, that the Security Council could not address. But I think there's going to be an increasing desire to go forward, I think, in the future. And although we might have to bypass the leaders in individual countries that have the, the veto rights, if we go to their people with, a, with an honest and, and, and fair and, and obviously attractive and, and advantageous change, then the political leaders might be forced by their own people to give up some of those privileges that they now enjoy. There's this gentleman. I was just introducing Kofi. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get no. another few minutes. No, I, I agree with you that the, the world has changed and the UN must change along with it and that the Security Council has to be reformed. Uh, I don't think you can reform it by withdrawing the, v, uh, the veto of the five permanent members. Uh, some will fight tooth and nail never to give it up. And besides, you need their approval before you can withdraw it. That's the way... Uh, it was set up. Uh, but you need to get some other important countries around the table. Uh, as in my time, and I think Edward Mortimer and others who worked with me are here, I pushed very hard to try and get the council reform. Uh, the proposal was to create possibly six additional permanent seats without vetoes to make room for the new and emerging powers you know, uh, Latin America doesn't have a single permanent seat. Africa with 54 countries doesn't. India with a, almost a fifth of the world's population is not there. Even if they don't have the veto, if they are around the table and they come with that weight, it will constrain, uh, to some extent, abuse of the veto. And there will be pressure for those who have the veto not to overuse it. Uh, and some have 
talked of uh, restraining the use of the veto, coming to an understanding on, on the what circumstances the veto can be, that would be difficult. But I think if you have um, uh, India at the table representing Asia, it's not the same as Bangladesh. If you have South Africa or uh, uh, Nigeria, it's not the same as Togo. Whether they have veto or not, you have to pay attention uh, to their weight. And I hope over time we will come to the, because if we don't, these countries will challenge. And instead of cooperation, we may get destructive competition. And a bad example for A bad example, because you make it more democratic and representative by reforming it and give it greater legitimacy. So the elders are going to speak out on this. Yeah. I'll take the final three, and then I'm afraid we'll have to bring it to a we close. take it all together. Yes, all three together. Gentlemen, there, there is this lady here, and final word to Kate Dunstall. Can you hear me? Uh, Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks very much to Mary Robinson and Kofi Annan on the issue of international migration. How can countries, and in particular their leaderships, uh, build cooperation, overcome their differences, and what's the role of multilateral institutions in that process? Fine. Yes. Thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, I have a quick question just about South Sudan and the peace process taking place there. There have been a number of peace processes within Sudan over the past 50, 60 years, and none of them have really uh, engaged with the question of cultural understanding. I'd like to find out from you what are some examples of concrete ways of institutionalizing cultural diplomacy and cultural understanding, uh, particularly in South Sudan right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the title today, Speaking Truth to Power, suggests that the powerful don't speak the truth and that truth is never in power. You have all been in power. Can you tell us... <laughs> Can you tell us how you coped with what you knew wasn't true and how you draw on that experience in your new roles. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I support I every one of you. <laughs> Give me a good well, <clears throat> one of the uh, basic requirements of an elder is that we are political has-beens. <laughs> we no longer have power. And if any of us are elected to office or have an official position, then we have to withdraw from the elders as long as we have it. So we uh, have the ability to represent what I mentioned earlier, that is the principles that do not change. We don't have to accommodate you know, changing circumstances, we just deal with the principles that never change. And those are basic th things that Nelson Mandela advised us to do, to concentrate on human rights and to peace and freedom and justice. So, uh, I think this is something that, that the elders can still, <clears throat> can still pursue. And so we, the elders, individually and collectively, we go where we please, we meet with whom we choose, and we say what we believe. And so that gives the elders, I think, a special status compared to people who now hold public office. So I'm not saying that we uh, never always speak the truth, but we try to tell the truth and we don't hesitate about speaking to the powerful, since we are no longer powerful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, would, I would want to comment briefly on that. I think I, I perhaps speak for Marty, Mary, and Jimmy uh, when he said you were in authority and you defined what speaking truth to power means. I, for me, speaking truth to power means people should have the courage to speak honestly and frankly to leaders, which they don't. <clears throat> you know, uh, often they shave the truth or sometimes they avoid unpleasant uh, issues. And so the leader goes on thinking he's doing the right thing, never challenged, you know, and, uh, but I hope when you want to speak truth to the uh, power, you, you will not hesitate. Of course, sometimes in some situations, there are risks 
That's why people uh, don't do it. But um, uh, I, I would want to encourage more frank discussions between leaders and their uh, citizens. The other question I would want to comment on was a question of migration and what international organizations can do. Uh, we established a global migration forum, which is chaired by Peter Sutherland, who lives, uh, who is here in London. This was 10, 12 years ago, and they meet every two years. It's now about over 100 countries which come together to discuss migration and share experience. Migration has been going on for a long time, and it cannot be stopped by the new parties or others. What is important is to find a way of managing migration effectively for the benefit of the migrant, the country of origin, country of transit, and the country of final destination, and making sure that there are rules that protect the migrant, but the migrant also has to know that they need to uh, uh, respect the rules of the country that has received them. So basically, it's managing migration, not stopping it. Uh, it is not going to be possible. Uh, and I would hope that as one discusses the future of migration, the emphasis will be how we manage it for the benefit of all. And besides, migration is healthy for society. Some countries honestly cannot maintain their current economic levels without <clears throat> migration. They're going to have very serious problems and uh, we need to accept that it can be positive. We talk of the dynamism of the United States and our migration has played a very important part in this. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Um, maybe briefly first on the speaking truth to power, which is a very central uh, value and uh, concern of the, of the elders. I, I remember when I was, um, uh, in fact, appointed by uh, Kofi Annan as, as High Commissioner for Human Rights, a poet friend of mine in Ireland said, um, if you become popular in that job, you won't be doing a good job. And I <laughs> kind of knew what was meant. Yeah. And it is true that people do not say to leaders what leaders need to hear. And few enough leaders have with them those who will tell them the real truth. And certainly, it's a problem in the African region, which I'm working in now. Leaders are in far too exalted a status and are treated you know, far too much as the big leaders, very remote from too often from the people that they should be serving. And there isn't that concept of service. So we really have to, to try to address that. But I wanted to answer the question about uh, South Sudan. In fact, the elders from the beginning have been working on both South Sudan and when it became an independent state, South Sudan. Um, in 2012, Jimmy Carter and Lakhto Brahimi, another of our um, elders, uh, went to Khartoum. And I went with Marty Atasari and Archbishop Desmond Tutu leading us uh, to South Sudan. And the elders today picked up the issue of South Sudan very much from the perspective that you were saying. How do we address the issue of needing to bring the sides in that country together to understand the deep cultural issues? When we were in South Sudan, we met um, a very vibrant group of women. Um, and that group um, I have met since then in Addis um, at a, a meeting. And I know that they can be a resource um, to try to bring the country together. There are also some faith-based leaders um, who are trying to uh, um, help in the situation. But it is necessary to, uh, to probe deeply and to, um, to continue the engagement. And I, uh, we, we are planning a visit of elders to South Sudan in the coming months. And I hope we will be able to help that country, which is in desperate humanitarian situation and also security situation at the moment. President Asari, you wanted to say. Now I ask for the floor from my chairman and he has kindly given me the permission because I wanted to clarify one thing that there must be no misunderstanding. What happened in Ukraine, at least from the perspective, I think that we share that. It's one thing what we think what the fate of, of Crimea should be or have some understanding on, on, on what that should be. But we have to be careful that we don't accept totally measures that are totally against international law, like the Russian military involvement and, and attack to Ukraine, 
against an independent country. That is totally unacceptable. It has nothing to do with what we think the fate of Crimea would be. But that act we can't accept. I give you another example when this group asked me in, in the end of February 22nd, 24th of February 2012 to go to New York and see all the ambassadors, permanent representatives of Western of, uh, five in the Security Council. Perhaps the most interesting one meeting I had with the Russian ambassador Vitaly Tsurkin, whom I know from many years when I was living in, in New York at the same time. He said me three things, because I said, I'm here to see what the elders might be doing. And when I was there, Kofi Annan was forced to take up the assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he honorably took that very difficult task. But what Surkin told me was three things. First, we should not arm the opposition. Second, we should start dialogue immediately between opposition and Assad regime. And three, we should find an elegant way for Assad to step aside. I went back to him and asked, does this mean that you could actually live with Syria where Assad would not be there? He said, yes. Nothing happened in the Security Council and I was extremely disappointed that this was not tested whether actually this meant that there would have been opening for some political uh, uh, solution of a conflict at that time. And so many people have died ever since. So these are the challenges I think we, one hopes that international community is much better in, in trying to solve. Because otherwise, uh, far too many people are dying and totally unnecessary. No. Marty, let me say that that position was tested because four months later, at the, in Geneva on 30th of June 2012, the communique had a paragraph in it that we should establish a transitional government with full executive authority. And Russia and all the permanent five signed on to it. And I had expected them to go to New York, go to the Security Council, get the council to endorse it and work together to implement it. It didn't happen. The, the, yeah, the, uh, they went and pointed fingers and accused each other. And that was one of the main reasons why I realized uh, I wasn't going to get anywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, we can carry on for a very long time. But I'd now like to invite the Vice Chancellor to thank the elders on our behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my reluctant duty to bring the events of this evening to a close, but it's my very pleasant duty on behalf of everyone here in the Sheldonian, on behalf of everyone watching this discussion online, to express our thanks to our distinguished guests this evening. It's an enormous privilege for us in Oxford to welcome the elders to the university to welcome old friends back to the university, both amongst the elders and uh, members of the Elders Advisory Council. We thank them for being here. We thank very much the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies for facilitating such a fascinating discussion this evening. The topic Conflict, dialogue, and peace remains eternally and sadly as relevant to mankind as ever before. And as we've heard in the questions and the discussion, there are so many areas and so many daily reports of violence and military and civil from around the world. It's excellent this evening to be reminded of what has been achieved and what can be achieved through dialogue. At this university, we are committed to raising the quality of that dialogue and thus the understanding that flows from it. We, raise, we hope to raise that quality through scholarship, through research that goes on throughout 
the university through the provision of evidence to inform policy makers and their decision making at such centers as the Oxford Martin School here at the university. But of course, so all, of course also in the education of our students, the graduates of Oxford who go on in many, many times to play significant roles throughout the world and in the training of policy makers for their future roles as is very much the case in the new School of Government, the Blavatnik School of Government here in Oxford. And so for us as a university committed to contributing and to helping resolve so many of the international issues that have been, the major issues that have been discussed this evening, it's an enormous pleasure for us to thank the elders for being here. It's my pleasure also to thank all of you for participating this evening, and particularly those of you who asked questions, who raised issues, who, lay, who laid out challenging problems that were responded to by our guests. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me again in thanking the elders, in thanking our distinguished guests for being here this evening, and most importantly, for their wise words in this discussion.